Number 10, Big Wheel. Wheel! Hey, wanna be a villain? Great. Just hire another guy to make you a big wheel with machine guns and rocket launchers on it so that you can ride around in it. It's that easy! That's what Jackson Wheel did. Can you guess what he called himself? When he first appeared, Big Wheel used his big wheel to chase and try to kill Rocket Racer while he was mid-fight with Spider-Man. Big Wheel wasn't even facing Spider-Man one-on-one. Just before he was about to get crushed, Spider-Man pulled Racer out of the way and Big Wheel drove right off the side of a building and right into the Hudson River ending both Jackson Wheel and his big wheel. All of this because Rocket Racer had some blackmail. Number nine, Crime Master. Why are there so many people who have no powers of any kind on Spider-Man's enemy list? This guy just walks around with a gun. That's it. He's another one of the many crime bosses in Marvel's New York. And I guess in that respect, he chose a very fitting name. He is a criminal and he has sort of mastered it. Usually, he employs others to do his dirty work for him. Although, he did partner with the Green Goblin for a short while before being shot and killed. He has come back from death multiple times under multiple different identities, which kinda made it hard for fans to follow who he is, even if they cared in the first place. Number eight, the living brain. Okay, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but isn't a brain just kinda living by default? Like, if it's an alive human being, isn't it technically a living brain? This guy isn't living or brain, I'm so confused. Okay, I'm gonna cut Marvel some slack here because the living brain is actually older than almost all of the main Marvel villains. He came before even the Green Goblin. He was created as a machine that could solve any problem, but malfunctioned after two guys got in a little scuffle and it went on a rampage until it was stopped by Spider-Man. It's been used by other smaller criminals, but was always stopped by Spider-Man, but hey, it eventually found steady work as a lab assistant and even saved the spit on a few occasions. So there's that at least. And it's seven, Dead Zone. There are a few characters more 90s than Dead Zone, but he has his appeal. Dead Zone sort of emulates the classic Iron Man villain whiplash with his electrical whips, but he's less a mercenary than just an ideological warrior. He seeks to punish sinners by lashing them to death that it has him run afoul with Moon Knight. Dead Zone first appeared in Moon Knight's solo title and is pretty evenly matched for the character. When Moon Knight tried to take him down with his adamantium, Dead Zone catches it and then turns it around on him. There is very little on the wiki about him and honestly I don't know what else I could say about him but he, he's trying to do what Moon Knight does but going about it in an absolutely abysmal way. Like come on bro, really? Whips? Like I get that they're OP and like the Spider-Man PS4 game but seem seriously underpowered in real life or in comic books unless they need them for plot or you're into that kind of thing. And it's six, Black Spectre. Carson Knowles was a veteran who returned home without applause. His job had been passed on and his wife left him with their son. He barely got by as a delivery man and found out his son was killed by foam. After his car was stripped for parts and a mugger accosted him, Knowles snapped and beat the man nearly to death. Seeking to destroy the city that treated him so badly, Carson Knowles ran as a dark horse candidate for mayor on his father's name and political connections. He also created a second identity as Black Spectre, beating and blackmailing the local precinct boss to support Knowles, and then in a fight with Moon Knight his mask slipped, but Moon Knight was unable to convince anyone that the mayoral candidate Knowles and Black Spectre were the same person. Eventually though, Moon Knight defeated Black Spectre in public and his assistant Marlene Arlone uncovered Knowles' corrupt plans for the city and his political office. So, at least, uh, at least he lost. Halfway through into number 5, Shadow Knight. Shadow Knight's real name is Randall Spector, Mark's younger brother. He was envious of Mark his entire life, which turned him into a horrible criminal. There was a murderer on the streets killing nurses called the Hatchet Man, so Moon Knight used his girlfriend Marlene as like bait to catch the killer. The plan worked, but Marlene perished. Yeah, and to make matters even worse, the Hatchet Man was revealed to be Randall. Randall later joined the cult of Khonshu, which ultimately resulted in him receiving the same powers as his brother Mark. However, he ended up choosing to use them for evil, donning the pseudonym Shadow Knight. Cause you know, every character needs to have a reverse version of themselves. Reverse Flash, Dark Archer, Bizarro. It was devastating for Mark to fight his brother and ultimately kill him by slitting his throat with a throwing crescent. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get much worse than that. Especially when you learn that Mark tried protecting Randall their entire lives. But then again, he killed your girlfriend, so... And for Midnight Man. 
Originally a collector of art, Anton Mogart would commit robberies at the stroke of midnight to build his collection. When Moon Knight stops him, he seemingly drowns in a river, but instead, he ends up becoming deformed by the waste found within the sewers. Then he goes insane and starts collecting trash, and teams with Bushman to defeat their sworn enemy. When Midnight Man finds out he's dying from cancer, he decides to find his son, hoping that he can share some of his final moments with him. Mogart does what he can to stop his son from turning to a life of crime like he once did, and in the wake of his death, he becomes the hero Midnight. It didn't last, and he ended up becoming a cyborg for the Secret Empire. Which while sounding bad, I think it would be kinda cool, like, to be a cyborg. Like, as long as I still have, like, my free will and my programming isn't controlling me, because that just doesn't sound like fun. Like, I want to be able to turn my arm into a giant cannon. That'd be great. Someone tries to mug me, I'm just like, sorry. <laughs> Getting close to the end in number three, Seth Falcon. He belongs to a Scottish sect of Knights Templar and has several amazing powers. I'll never do that accent again. Falcon first appeared in Mark Spector Moon Knight number 43. Seth Falcon is immortal, has superhuman strength and stamina, but his strongest power is his touch. Using his clawed fingers, Falcon can drain the life force out of any living being, aging them in the process. If he holds his grip for long enough, Seth can drain the, the entire life out of somebody, all of it, turning them into a rotted skeleton. However, there's a catch. Due to feedback, the draining process backfires if Seth uses it on anybody who shares his DNA code, even partially. Simply put, he can't drain his relatives because it causes the mm, series of issues that then hurts and weakens his powers. And yep, that's right. You guessed it. Of course, Moon Knight turns out to be one of his long lost relatives. So, Falcon has to rely on his superhuman strength and stamina to outlast Mark Spector in any mutual fight. Which is good, because that kind of like levels the playing field. Penultimately, in the number two, Cactus. Sometimes a name is just a name. It could have meaning or it could just be something cool that the guy thought of that ended up kind of making sense. Other times names are extremely direct and are probably too on point. That's the case with Cactus, who is exactly what he sounds like and nothing more. Created by Dominus, he's been a villain of the West Coast Avengers and Moon Knight on various occasions. Punching him definitely stings, but beyond that it, it doesn't take all that much to to, to break him or chop him up because you know he's a cactus which has actually happened before though he can regenerate lost limbs which I don't know if cactuses can do or cacti can do but yeah he's without a doubt one of the lamest villains in the Marvel Universe but in my opinion that makes him one of the coolest this guy is literally a cactus and that's hilarious a couple years ago the girl I was with at the time and I came up with a superhero that we called cact guy who was basically in essence Cactus. And we didn't know that it was actually a thing. But it's funny to me that someone actually made this and then put it in the goddamn Marvel Universe. That's hilarious. That's amazing. And Cactus is my new favorite villain ever because of that. Cacti hashtag Cactus in the MCU. And finally, in the number one, Hunter's Moon. Dr. Batter was born in Luxor, Egypt to two doctors and was an excellent student throughout his life, eventually becoming a doctor as well. He grew to become a very rational and serious person who didn't believe in any higher entities, despite still attending prayer and studying the Quran and the Hadith. This all changed when he was attacked by vampires and left to die on the streets, at which point he met the Egyptian moon god Khonshu. Dr. Batter survived and became a worshipper of Khonshu, who fancied himself the god's second highest priest and opposite of Mark's Specter. After learning that Moon Knight had taken in vampires under his protection, Dr. Batter terrorized the Nightwalkers to get his attention. Hunter's Moon eventually confronted Moon Knight, chastised him for taking in enemies of Khonshu, and expressed his intentions to correct him. Dr. Batter beat Moon Knight and invaded the Midnight Mission to kill the vampires, but Spectre recovered and knocked him unconscious after attacking him from behind. But you know what, after beating him, I'm not even gonna call it, that's kinda shady. I respect it. Number 10, Trapster. Oddly enough, although Trapster is a super weird and relatively obscure villain, he still somehow made his way into a surprising number of comics. I mean, he has been around since the 60s, so considering that, I guess not so many? But we're still talking over a hundred issues at least, which is pretty weird considering who Trapster is. Trapster is weird because, well, he was originally known as the guy who came armed with a glue gun, or a paste gun, if you will. Initially, he was known by the supervillain named Paste Pot Pete. However, Trapster has since come to loathe that name and much prefers to be called Trapster instead, as he feels
feels the former name makes him sound lame and is often used out of disrespect for him. Admittedly, he is kind of lame though. Sorry Trapster, you might be a genius, but you still fight with glue. So anyone that fights with a glue gun, I'm just saying. Although I will say if it was a hot glue gun, glue gun burns do hurt a lot. Number 9. Polka Dot Man You might think you know Polka Dot Man, but do you really know him? If you've seen The Suicide Squad, you are familiar with a version of Abner Krill, but the original Polka Dot Man, also Abner Krill of the New Earth continuity, was a little bit different when it came to his power set, at least initially. Initially when Polka Dot Man or Mr. Polka Dot first appeared, he came armed with multiple different weapons which all came from the Polka Dots on his suit. He could pull them off and basically turn them into any means of different weapons and devices, even once turning one into a getaway vehicle. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to talk more weird, obscure things from comics with me, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. This list actually has everything that I love. Weird, obscure, and villains. I love all of those things. Number 8. Vanisher Vanisher was actually one of the first villains that the X-Men came up against way back in X-Men issue number 2. In short, he was weird because he gave the X-Men so much trouble, especially considering Marvel Girl was on the team and he was only a teleporter. Though at this time, they'd never encountered a teleporter before and were fairly new heroes. Also, Jean likely unknowingly had mental blocks in place. Vanisher's demise was also quite dark and odd when Professor X, who had left the X-Men to fight alone initially as a test, finally came to their aid and easily defeated Vanisher by making him forget who he was. Which honestly is a pretty horrifying punishment. Don't worry though, that wouldn't be the end of Vanisher and he'd also end up getting a much less extravagant costume. Which actually is kinda sad, I do like his original costume, with its like, whole, its whole thing. It's very red and patterned. And it's seven birthday boy. Ray Salinger was a serial killer who operated in Gotham. Under the alias Birthday Boy, he was actually the first costume criminal encountered by Batman during his crime fighting career. Introduced in Batman Earth 1 Volume 1 in 2012, Birthday Boy is fascinated by young girls resembling his first kill, a 15 year old named Amanda Grant. When in his killer mode, he wears a burlap sack with holes cut out for his eyes and a birthday party hat, usually in a room decorated like a young girl's room at a birthday party. Great. As a calling card, he left birthday candles where he stole away his victim and told his victims to make a wish to a cake decorated with the words Happy Birthday Amanda. Which is only creepier since we have our own Amanda here and I feel like this guy is a representation of all our DMs. I think the sickest part of this character though was that when Batman first started, Birthday Boy had been hired by Mayor Oswald Cobblepot to eliminate his various enemies. And in return, he was given girls from the street or enemies of the penguin as a reward. God, this is something that you'd see on like criminal minds. And at six, the King of Cats. It first introduced in, I don't think this was ironically, Batman number 69, nice, from 1952, Carl Kyle is the brother of Selina Kyle, who was inspired by his sister's infamy to become a costume criminal. His cat like garb and his crimes revolved around the theme of cats, and he resembles a male version of Catwoman. In March of 1952, Gotham City was struck by a series of feline related crimes, perpetrated not by the now reformed Selina Kyle, but by a costume criminal known as the King of Cats. Carl sends flowers to Selina, causing Batman to investigate her involvement, like the jealous boyfriend he is. He soon becomes convinced that she is innocent, but asks that her, the expert on feline themed crimes, didn't know that was a thing, to aid him and Robin in arresting the King of Cats. Selina, however, refuses because it's her brother, but she doesn't tell Batman that. He gets captured easily by Batman and has his handed to him multiple times. I guess you're a punching bag when you're not a female that Batman wants to sleep with. Sorry, Carl. Halfway through in at number 5, Mirror Man. Lloyd Ventress is a criminal who was detained at Gotham State Penitentiary. Using broken mirror shards, he distracts the guards long enough to escape from prison. Then, inspired by mirrors, somehow, he becomes Mirror Man. Upon creating a machine that would enable him to look through objects, Mirror Man began targeting Batman so he could figure out his secret identity. He literally discovers Batman's secret identity by using an X-ray mirror, which is freaking nuts. Mirror Man gets sent to prison before he can reveal the identity, however. However, but because they want conflict, he manages to escape, with a plan to reveal Bruce's identity to the world. Only foiled when Alfred, dressed as Batman, interrupts a press conference Bruce Wayne was holding, instantly disproving the fact that Batman is Bruce Wayne because he saw them both in the same room. However, the public should have also seen this coming, so maybe the people of Gotham City are dumber than we thought. Well, I mean, they had Condiment King, so I, I, guess, I guess they are pretty dumb. <laughs> 
and in for a calculator. While the calculator now seems to be an oracle of sorts for supervillains, the original purpose and MO of the calculator is far more entertaining and interesting for me. Noah Cutler began his criminal career by crossing the country and getting into fights with various superheroes intentionally, analyzing and recording their battle tactics to ensure that he couldn't be beaten again. Or in some incarnations, he would simply get beaten and then press a button on his chest to ensure that he didn't get beat again. Maybe that was taking down the information or something, I don't know. But either way, do you know how insanely overpowered that could have been? Just being able to press a button on your chest and then boom, you're instantly basically immune to Batman or Robin or even Superman. That would be amazing. You do this enough times and you can just do whatever you want. Then other villains start paying you to do their crimes for them because you guarantee success. That's freaking nuts. I wish they kept that calculator because he could have been a bigger villain than Darkseid if he kept going like that. Damn, that would have been awesome. <laughs> Getting close to the end in number three, Killer Moth. Having decided that the lawbreakers of Gotham City needed a costume protector just as the honest citizens needed Batman, Killer Moth emulated the Dark Knight in every way, copying his paraphernalia and building on his legend to create his own supervillain identity, like Batman's version of Reverse Flash. He even had his own moth signal that supervillains could use when they were in trouble. Drewy Walker, introduced in Batman number 63 in 1951, is actually the first supervillain Barbara Gordon ever Ever defeated as Batgirl. Which I mean probably doesn't support the whole most powerful thing, but think about it. If Mothman was worried more about his twisted sense of justice than money as he was motivated by, he would have been an insane villain. Wanting to protect the criminal underworld just for the sake of it rather than to get paid, while maybe slightly more unrealistic, would make him insane. He also ended up basically making a devil's bargain to become more powerful, but that resulted in him becoming a hideous creature that truly resembled the name Killer Moth. So, that could have been something. But ultimately, in number two, the Eraser. The Eraser was the chosen alias of Lenny Fiasco, who turned to crime after living his college days under constant mocking and taunting by his classmates. Fiasco is a professional at covering up the tracks of other crimes. For a 20% cut, the Eraser will erase the evidence of another crime. And honestly, I think that this is the only job that anyone with the last name Fiasco could have. Sorry. This villain's power is a special helmet designed to look like a pencil eraser that can wipe off evidence, even though that would be invisible to the naked eye. Which is actually pretty damn cool when you think about it. After Batman posed as a villain to try to capture the Eraser, the villain told Bruce, who he had realized was Bruce, that he had actually become a criminal because Bruce shattered his dreams of going out with Celia Smith. Bruce didn't even remember her name, which made Eraser even angrier, but yeah. I think that this is the absolute coolest concept for a supervillain though, because in all honesty, if this guy just wasn't an idiot, he would have ruled the world. Straight up, this guy would ruin every single investigation. He could turn the tide of trials. This guy would end up being a shadow government. If only he wasn't a dumb Finally, in at number one, Lex Joker. Lex Joker was created when John D, also known as Dr. Destiny, collapsed the DC universe in half. First appearing in Batman slash Superman number 60 in 2009, Lex Joker is a combination of, you guessed it, Clayface and Bane. No, just kidding, it's Joker and Lex Luthor. Lex Joker hired Doomstroke and Terranado to destroy the Justice Titans. However, after the JTs allied with Batman and Superman, he hired four more mercenaries to create the Brotherhood of Injustice. Thanks Thanks to Terra, who had gone undercover within the JTs, they were able to attack the Justice Tower and, come on, let's be honest, if you have the brains of Lex Luthor and the complete insanity of the Joker, that's one hell of an opponent. Number 10, Emperor Marco Regnos. Marco Regnos is a pretty spooky looking Sith Lord and Emperor. He battled Sith Lord Simus to become the new ruler of the Sith Empire and take for himself the title of Dark Lord of the Sith. In his battle against Simus, he defeated him by separating his head from his body. Ragnos was a manipulative sort as emperor and managed to hold on to his rule for hundreds of years by pitting his rivals against one another, thereby eliminating them as threats to his own rule. Even after his death, Ragnos' presence was felt, and he reappeared as a force ghost, informing those who fought over his position that only the most worthy would succeed him. Millennia later, an attempt was actually made to even resurrect Ragnos using energy pulled from the force through various
various force nexuses found throughout the galaxy. And this attempt actually almost succeeded. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, and if you think to yourself, man, I wish they did more Star Wars content, guess what? We have done some of that. You can go check out our Star Wars playlist for even more. Number 9. Savage Opress Savage Opress is an interesting figure. He first appeared in Star Wars The Clone Wars. He is the younger brother of Darth Maul who, like his brother, would also become a Sith Lord. However, he was also a Knight Brother as well on his home world. As a Knight Brother, he was chosen by Asajj Ventress to become her mate, pledging himself fully to her and being bent by the Knight Sisters magics to obey her. To prove his loyalty to her, he even murdered his own brother. Not Darth Maul of course, but instead his brother Feral. Eventually, Opress would escape Ventress's control, breaking the spell that the Knight Sisters had cast over him, and breaking off from both Ventress and his master, Count Dooku. He would then go on to join up with Darth Maul, who eventually took him on as his own apprentice. Number 8. Darth Plagueis Did you ever hear of the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? I thought not. It's not a story the Jedi would tell you. Darth Plagueis was the Sith Master of Darth Sidious, who many of course know more commonly by his other name, Emperor Palpatine. Plagueis himself had an obsession that runs all all the way back to actually the creation of the Sith, and in fact could be cited as kind of the reason for the initial split in the Force. He wanted to discover the secret to eternal life, and eventually developed somewhat of an ability to prevent death and create even life. However, this ability would not save him in the end, as his apprentice Darth Sidious would eventually betray him, killing him in his sleep so that he might become the new master, taking Plagueis' power for himself. Plagueis is first mentioned in the prequel film Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Here, Emperor Palpatine tells Anakin the legend of Plagueis as he attempts to kind of lure him to the dark side. Although right after that Anakin's basically like, I think this guy's a Sith Lord. <laughs> Here, Emperor Palpatine refers to his former master as Darth Plagueis the Wise. It was likely because of Plagueis' pursuit of knowledge in bioengineering that Palpatine himself was in a fashion able to prolong his own life. Although he too would obviously fail to become truly immortal, at least as far as we know. I hope that's where it stays. <laughs> I hope he's gone. <laughs> oh my goodness. Could you imagine Emperor Palpatine just comes up again and we're like, oh my gosh, this guy. Number seven, critical mass. I just want to say that I think Marvel has something against severely overweight people. The amount of supervillains who are just massive is actually ridiculous. We got the Slug, the Blob, the Shadow King, Pink Pearl, the Kingpin too, although that's actually all muscle, and then there's Critical Mass, aka Arnie Gunderson. Arnie was one of Peter Parker's classmates back in the fourth grade, and eventually he gained the mutant ability to project explosive forces from his fingertips, which is actually a really cool power. But that didn't save Arnie from being just a massive man for seemingly no reason. Together with some other evil mutants, he formed the Band of Baddies, and with a name like that, you know we got some real winners here. The band abducted another explosive mutant named Mary Beck, which brought them into conflict with Wolverine and Spider-Man. Unfortunately for the baddies, one of their number threatened Mary, who then accidentally unleashed her powers, taking out every single one of the villains on this team. And we never saw Critical Mass ever again. The end. Lasted three issues of Marvel Comics Presents. That's it. He's gone. Number six, Big Wheel. Hey! Do you want to be a villain? Great! Just hire another guy to make you a big wheel with rocket launchers and all that stuff on it that you can just ride around in. It's that easy! That's what Jackson Wheel did. Can you guess what he called himself? When he first appeared, Big Wheel used his big wheel to chase and try to take out Rocket Racer while he was mid-fight with Spider-Man. Big Wheel wasn't even facing Spider-Man one-on-one, he just showed up. Just before he was about to get crushed though, Spider-Man pulled Racer out of the way and Big Wheel drove right off the side of a building and right into the Hudson River, ending both Jackson Wheel and his big wheel. All of this because Rocket Racer had some blackmail. That's all it was. Number five, Hypno Hustler. Just look. Look at this dazzling man. What an icon. The Hypno Hustler made his debut in the 80s, which I hope is not a surprise to anyone. Just look at him. He uses a hypnotic guitar to hypnotize people, wears headphones that stop him from hypnotizing himself, which is hilarious, and has boots that emit knockout gas and have retractable knives in them for some reason. It's a crazy combo. His story involves him performing at the nightclub Beyond Forever, where Peter Parker and his pals just happen to be hanging out. Him and his band use their hypnotic 
ethnic grooves to hypnotize a crowd into giving up their goods. Peter Parker, though, being the hero, obviously knows what's going on and changes into his Spidey suit. During the fight, he realizes that the headphones are the only thing keeping Hypno Hustler from hypnotizing himself, and Spider-Man, he just removes them. That's it and the fight's over. Number four, the headmen. Sometimes it just takes the smallest of things to bring people together. And while that may sound like an extremely beautiful sentiment, I'm saying it in relation to the villainous team known as the headmen, who seem to have come together just because each of their powers revolve around their heads in one way or another. And it's honestly, kind of unsettling in my opinion. Bonded together through their weird heads, these scientists sought out world domination, bringing them into conflict with the Defenders, She-Hulk, and of course, Spider-Man. The quartet consisted of Arthur Nagin, their leader, who had his head transplanted onto the body of a gorilla for some reason, Ruby Thursday, who replaced her own head with an organic computer capable of changing shape, which is actually really cool, Gerald Morgan, aka Shrunken Bones, accidentally shrank his own skeleton, including his skull so he basically just has really baggy skin, which is very creepy, and Chandu the Mystic's head had been transplanted by Nagin onto a number of different bodies through his time, making him actually quite versatile. Number three, Sly. A chemical engineer turned super thief, decked out in a super slippery suit, Jalone Bleacher created a chemical coating that basically eliminated the friction between an object and any surface it came into contact with, which, not even joking here, that could be really, really useful. Like, good job, man. That would work really well in the real world. Too bad the company that he worked for closed their R&D department and Jalome had to find a way to independently fund his project. Honestly, I would just find another company who wanted to fund me, but then I wouldn't appear on a list of people you've never heard of. And that is a goal of mine. He created a suit with the chemical and used his slippery abilities to rob banks and try to destroy his old boss's business. His only other notable mentions were his midlife crisis and his his eventual passing into the afterlife in a side story of the Civil War event where he was attacked from behind for refusing to side with crime boss Hammerhead. I guess you could say that they had some friction. Sorry. Number two, Spider-Side. Sony's animated Spider-Verse films have not only achieved tremendous success, but have also popularized the concept of multiverse storytelling, encouraging audiences to embrace innovative takes on Spider-Man's character. Within this realm of creative exploration, Spider-Side emerges as a rather obscure figure originating from the controversial Clone Saga. In that tangled web of narratives, Spider-Side assumes the role of a perplexing third party alongside Peter Parker and Ben Riley casting doubt on the true identity of the authentic Spider-Man. Now as the story unfolds, Spider-Side's transformation takes a dark and pretty unsettling turn when he evolves into a molecular monstrosity that bears a closer resemblance to the grotesque shape-shifting abilities of Carnage rather than the iconic traits of Spider-Man himself. His character complicated the already pretty complex story, but he was also actually pretty cool, and I always wondered if we would see him again, and we have with the opening up of the Spider-Verse. Yay! Number one, Stegron. In the world of Spider-Man, the lizard was born from Dr. Kurt Connors' experiments with reptile DNA. However, if you ever wondered what would transpire should Connors delve into the realm of dinosaur DNA, Vincent Stegron, known as Stegron the Dinosaur Man, provides the very answer you would expect. After a fateful journey to the Savage Land, Connors embarks on a scientific endeavor that basically creates the exact same lizard villain, but as a humanoid Stegosaurus. Notably, Stegron possesses raw power that technically actually surpasses other animal-based villains like the Lizard and the Rhino. He has crossed paths with formidable adversaries such as Venom on multiple occasions and even forged a not at all surprising partnership with the Lizard in the Marvel team-up series. Yet, it's his untamed and wild nature that has occasionally posed challenges for the character. But also, he's a Stegosaurus. I see why I didn't catch on. In a 10 Werewolf by Night. The first time we've seen Moon Knight in the comics actually wasn't in his own series, but rather Werewolf by Night number 32. He faced off against Jack Russoff, aka Werewolf by Night, making Russoff his enemy. However, technically, Moon Knight was the villain in this scenario, hence its placement at number 10. Jacob Russoff is a werewolf, but unlike his dad, also a werewolf, Jack could control when and where he would transform, not just under a full moon. He had much more control over his abilities in werewolf form as well, except for when there was a full moon, because that's when 
when Jack would be at his strongest, but also completely out of control. Which is a concept that sounds a lot like a D&D character. His superpowers include werewolf physiology, along with superhuman strength, speed, durability, agility, stamina, a healing factor, and of course, a hairy body packed with a nasty set of teeth and killer claws. Something the ladies love. In at 9, Morpheus. Morpheus first appeared in Moon Knight number 12 back in the early 80s, and he's one of like the rare horrifying characters that people actually feel sympathy for. Despite his vampiric appearance, he should not be mistaken for Morbius. This is a different person. The character who's been who's getting the standalone movie, no one knows what universe it's in. Yeah. Morbius is indeed a pseudo-vampire, while Morpheus is something else entirely. His real name is Robert Markham, and he got sick from an old virus that caused segments of his DNA to be in inhibited by the virus. He sought medical attention and Dr. Peter Alron gave him an untested drug to help him, but it all backfired, causing Markham to change dramatically appearance-wise while also taking away Markham's need for sleep and giving him unfathomable psionic powers. However, the lack of sleep rendered him crazy, after which he had taken the alias Morpheus after the Olympian God of Dreams. With his newfound powers, Morpheus sought revenge upon Alron, only to encounter Moon Knight in the process. And it ain't Count Nefaria. While Count Nefaria wasn't purely evil at first, his desire for more wealth and power is ultimately his downfall, and he's very nefarious. He has been around for years and years, fighting almost every single Avenger he can think of. He also encountered Moon Knight after Mark Spector moved to LA and joined the West Coast Avengers, primarily becoming his villain. Count Nefaria is immortal and has an unfathomably strong healing factor, because you know, he's immortal. He received energy projection from the living laser, strength from Power Man, and speed from Whirlwind, all ample a hundred times. He can lift well over a hundred tons, fly over 5,000 miles per hour, teleport, leech another person's energy, and so much more. However, it, it, it's likely that if you are a fan of Moon Knight, you knew about this guy, so he's not very high on the list. But honestly, not having known much about Moon Knight before this list, aside from he looks freaking awesome, all these villains are pretty new to me, so it's pretty cool getting to see all the characters that this guy has faced, and hopefully you at least hear about a few that you didn't know about. But no complaining if you're Moon Knight super fan, okay? That's not all up. That's cheating. Number seven, big man. I ain't got the facilities for that big man. He really didn't. Frederick Foswell was a reporter at the Daily Bugle, and, um, well, he was a little guy. Except when he wasn't. You see, Foswell was a master of disguise, and he used the costume that gave him a nice little hype boost in order for him to become aptly named Big Man. From this stature, he can now ride the adult roller coasters, reach the top shelf, and be the head of the crime gang, the Enforcers. Spider-Man works with the guy though, so unsurprisingly he was caught and incarcerated for a time. But Jonah gave him his job back afterwards, which is nice. He ended up dying in front of a bullet to save Jonah, so at least he wasn't all bad. Number 6, Black Fox. This one is a little sad. See, Black Fox is basically just a jewel thief who has had a very long career seeing how he is now an old man. Just a regular jewel thief? Well, why is this a problem for Spider-Man? It's not. It's really not. But you see, the problem for Spider-Man is that being an old man, Black Fox heavily reminds Peter of his Uncle Ben, which meant that Peter couldn't help but have a soft spot for the guy. He would let Black Fox go multiple times. I mean, I get it. I respect it. But Peter realized his weakness and stopped easing up on the old guy, finally throwing him in the slammer. While he isn't exactly threatening to anyone, he is the mentor of Black Cat, which does give him some notoriety. Number five, Mirage. What's the best way to stop a robber? Oh, oh, I, I know, I know, I know. Uh, drop a chandelier on him. Wow, um, yeah, I guess that works. Mirage is a robber, but not just any robber. Oh, no, 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 no. He and his gang had a specialty for robbing weddings. Honestly, Who's expecting that? I mean, I wouldn't be. I'd be so surprised, I just, I just give him my money, you know? He made a bad choice though, when he decided to rob the wedding of Ned Leeds and Betty Brant, where none other than Peter Parker was in attendance. Peter used his web shooters to turn off all the lights and don his spider suit. The day was saved when Spider-Man dropped the whole chandelier on Mirage, defeating him. Ouch. Number four, the spot. Could you imagine that the first time you reveal yourself to a hero, they just drop on the floor laughing at you? And, on top of that, it's in front of Kingpin, one of the biggest crime lords in Marvel. It would be super embarrassing, except when you totally win and make them look dumb. Way to go, man. The Spot, yes, that's his name, had the power to create interdimensional portals, big and small, which he used to defeat Spider-Man and Black Cat the first time they encountered him. But only the first time. See, the Spot can only create as many portals as he has spots on his body. 
throwing them wherever he wants until he runs out, which he did in this second encounter with Spidey. And then he lost. Pretty badly. He's appeared here and there since, but he never really posed a threat to anyone. Like, anyone at all. Oh, uh, but he did create the failed group, the Spider-Man Revengeance Squad, with other minor characters that lasted like, uh, two seconds. Hold up, I gotta stop you right there. Just wanted to let you know that I appreciate you. And I hope you appreciate us too. If you do, why not give us a little like and a follow? <laughs> it really helps us to help you spend your free time watching top 10 videos. Uh, but hey, no judgment. We all do it. Number three, slide. A chemical engineer turned super thief decked out in a super slippery suit. All right, let's 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 get it over with. Jalome Bleacher created a chemical coating that basically eliminated the friction between an object and any surface it came into contact with. Which, not even joking here, that could be really really useful. Like, good job, man. <laughs> Too bad the company he worked for closed their R&D department and Jalome had to find a way to independently fund this project. Honestly, I, I would have just found another company who wanted to fund me, but then I wouldn't appear on a list of people you never heard of, and that is a goal of mine. He created a suit with the chemical and used his slippery abilities to rob banks and try to destroy his old boss's business. His only other notable mentions were his midlife crisis and his death in a side story of the Civil War event where he was shot in the back for refusing to side with crime boss Hammerhead. I I guess you could say that they had some friction. Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna slide my way to the door. Number two, Stilt Man. So long as I am the master of my stilts, I'm unbeatable. I'm completely invincible. <laughs> um, Wilbur, just, just stop. Just stop, man. Despite being an adversary to both Daredevil and Spider-Man, Stilt Man just couldn't seem to be taken seriously. I can't possibly imagine why. Oh wait, no, 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 I can, I can. It's, it's the stilts. Yeah, 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 it's the stilts. What's interesting is that if you go into his Marvel Wiki page, Stiltman actually has quite a long history being involved in many storylines. And his stilts are actually pretty strong. At one point, the strength of them was able to plunge She-Hulk so far into the ground, she ended up in the subway. But then she beat him in a really embarrassing way. I mean, just look. His stilts could reach up to 290 feet though, which is actually kind of cool, I think. Number one, Hypno Hustler. Okay, just, just look, look at this dazzling man. What an icon. The Hypno Hustler made his debut in the 80s, which I hope isn't a surprise to anyone. He uses a hypnotic guitar to hypnotize people, wears headphones that stop him from hypnotizing himself, and has boots that emit knockout gas and have retractable knives. What a combo! His story involves him performing at the nightclub Beyond Forever, where Peter Parker and pals just happen to be. Him and his band use their hypnotic grooves to hypnotize the crowd into giving up their goods. Peter Parker, being the hero, obviously knows what's going on and changes into his Spidey suit. During the fight, he realizes the headphones are the only thing keeping Hypno Hustler from hypnotizing himself, and Spider Man removes them. That's it. Fight over. Number 10, Angle Man. You may have forgotten about Angle Man and his angler, but don't worry, I'll make sure you never forget. Angle Man has never been considered an A list villain, likely because he has such a ridiculous name. Although, hey, at least it does begin with an A. And because he often fights with what looks like some kind of protractor. Because, I mean, Angles, get it? Angle man. But his angler, as it's known, is actually a very powerful piece of equipment that can be used to manipulate space and time. Although I'm sure it could be used as a ruler or to help measure angles in a pinch as well. Bonus. Since his introduction as Angelo Bend, a brilliant and often technologically capable criminal who sometimes dressed up like a stage magician, he has been rebooted and is now known for being Vandal Savage's son. That's an angle of this character we hadn't seen before. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not make sure you check out our other playlist? Number 9. Grail. Grail is the powerful daughter of Darkseid and the Amazonian assassin Myrna. Being that she is both Amazonian by birth and also a new god, she is extremely powerful. She's also been shown to possess magical abilities as well that even allow her to have some power over life and death, successfully bringing back her father, Darkseid, after he died. Initially though, Grail was actually born with her mother's hope that Grail would one day be the key to defeating Darkseid. However, there was also a prophecy that Grail would one day cause, um, 
great destruction, with this prophecy putting her in danger immediately after she was born. Her mother Myrna gave birth to Grail at the same time that Hippolyta bore Princess Diana, forever entwining their fates, perhaps to one another in some way. I would say so, since Grail's kind of like a dark version of Wonder Woman. But you know, dark version of Wonder Woman if she was dark sides. Daughter. Number 8. Deimos Deimos is known for being one of the many children of Ares. He first appeared in the original run of Wonder Woman in issue 183. He is the twin brother of Phobos, who created Decay. Together, these brothers attempted to battle Diana after Phobos' plan of using Decay failed. Deimos planned to poison Wonder Woman in battle with his snake-like hair, which infected those it touched with a fear-inducing toxin. In the end, however, Wonder Woman beats him by removing his head with her often underused tiara. That thing is seriously sharp. Deimos also made a somewhat recent reappearance in the comics in issue number 18 of Trinity, entering the Prime Earth continuity in 2018, although he's only appeared in just over a handful of issues since. Number 7. Darth Malgus Darth Malgus was originally known by his given name Veridun. As Veridun, he was raised in a part of space that was loyal to the Empire, and when his Force sensitivity first manifested, when he uh, killed a servant, he was sent to the Sith Academy for further training, which honestly makes a lot of sense. If you know the Force kind of seems to be strong with you and then you kill someone, definitely time for the Sith Academy. He first appeared in the Deceived trailer for the video game Star Wars The Old Republic. Following his training, he became a Sith warrior, serving in the Imperial Army. As an apprentice to Darth Vindican, he took the name of Darth Malgus for himself. After suffering a dramatic defeat and injury on Alderaan, he was forced to permanently wear a respirator. Initially, his attempt to invade Alderaan had actually been successful, with him actually launching a pretty efficient surprise attack. But afterwards, the Republic managed to push back the Sith in response with their own successful counterattack. So, and that's where he got pretty badly injured. Number six, Emperor Darth Revan. Darth Revan is an interesting one. Not many knew of the character's relevance as a Sith Lord, due to the Sith history only being known, of course, to Sith cultists throughout the galaxy. As such, Revan's name was mainly unknown, lost to the sands of time. Revan, however, would have a Stormtrooper Legion named after them because Fun fact! Stormtrooper legions are apparently typically named after Sith Lords, ancient Sith Lords. In truth, Revan was a former Jedi Knight who left the Order and ended up becoming the Dark Lord of the Sith. They formed a Sith Empire, but eventually became an amnesiac who was retrained and indoctrinated into the Jedi Order, later actually used to fight against the very Sith Empire they had once built. Revan is actually the character that you play as in the game Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, and can be customized to look however you prefer them to look, with you also choosing Using their gender. In canon, however, Revan was established as male, with the light side ending of the game being established in lore as the canon ending. So, just so you know that. Number 5. Darth Talon While I feel like female Sith Lords are weirdly rare, Talon is a great one, who really makes up for the lack of quantity of Sith ladies with just straight up quality. Talon herself is visually striking, covered head to toe in Sith tattoos. Each of these tattoos were earned through ritual combat. She was the apprentice initially of Sith Lord Darth Ryan, but would betray him at the command of Dark Lord of the Sith Emperor Darth Krayt, separating his head from his body with her lightsaber. As you you know, a lot of Sith Lords love to do that. Talon would become one of two of Krayt's most loyal followers and apprentices, and when he was eventually defeated, she actually ended up going into hiding, continuing to operate in the shadows, striving to serve the needs and accomplish the goals of the One Sith, which is sometimes also known as the New Sith Order. Darth Talon was created by John Ostrander and Jan Dersema, and was first introduced in the Dark Horse comic series Star Wars Legacy. Number 4. Ajunta Paul Ajunta Paul was the first Dark Lord of the Sith. The very very first one. Although being the first ruler of the First Order of Siths, he did not have a Sith name that he was known by, at least not one that I was able to find, instead being simply known as just Ajunta Paul or Master Paul to his followers. As indicated by his title, Paul was once a Jedi and Jedi Master, a member of the Jedi Order. He began to study alchemy during his time as a Jedi and would discover how to create and shape life. Despite this impressive discovery, the Jedi Order did not celebrate Paul, but instead feared him and his newfound power deeming it as part of the dark side of the force and condemning him. For this, he was kicked out of the Jedi Order, who then attempted to basically erase the knowledge of his discoveries in order to prevent anyone else from tampering with this newfound power. Frustrated at having been judged and rejected, Master Paul and his followers declared war on the Order, beginning the period known in history as the Hundred Year Darkness. Paul comes from the Expanded Universe and I believe first appeared in the Dark Horse Star Wars comics. Number 3. Darth Bane Darth Bane 
while perhaps not as well known in terms of Sith and Sith Lords, is actually quite an important Sith in terms of their history. He is the creator of the Rule of Two. The Rule of Two maintains that at all times there can only be two Sith, a master and their apprentice. Bane actually created the Rule of Two to protect the Sith after being the lone survivor of the Jedi Sith War. Bane believed that the Sith's competitive nature and their focus on destroying one another had ultimately weakened them to the point that, you know, he was the last one. So he created the Rule of Two to help them better, somewhat, work together, thereby preserving them and their beliefs. The Jedi Sith War happened about a thousand years prior to the events of the Clone Wars and resulted in almost all of the Sith being wiped out by the Jedi Order, save for Bane. The Rule of Two might seem like a small thing considering that it doesn't seem to, you know, greatly increase the Sith's numbers, only going from one Sith at the top to like two of them, but it actually was successful in prolonging their survival thousands of years into the future. After the death of Darth Bane, who was killed supposedly by his own apprentice, the Jedi believed they had succeeded in wiping out all of the Sith, and a thousand year era of peace was ushered in. However, his apprentice survived, becoming the new master. With the Jedi left unsuspecting, this actually allowed the Sith to plot in the shadows, spreading their influence throughout the galaxy and bolstering their power in secret. Darth Bane first appeared in Star Wars The Clone Wars. Number 2. Darth Xana Darth Xana is relatively unknown even within the world of Star Wars itself, but still serves a super important role in the continuation and evolution of the Sith. Xana was the apprentice of Darth Bane. She was trained to carry on the rules and teachings of Bane, including the self-preserving Rule of Two. We don't know much about her, or even really how she killed her master, but it's believed that she fought and killed Bane in a duel. Xana has only been mentioned a few select times in Star Wars media, and it's not only a mysterious figure to Star Wars fans, but also to characters within the world, as accurate historical records were, you know, not really kept in regards to her life and her story. She was actually first mentioned in the novel Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace by Terry Brooks, based off the film, of course, of the same name. Here, Darzana was first wrongfully referred to using the pronoun him, and this would actually later be corrected in other media where instead it would be established that Xana used the pronouns of she, her. Now we know Xana probably lady. Be cool to actually hear more about Darth Xana. I would be interested. Number one, Emperor Darth Vitiate. Darth Vitiate is quite the Sith. While to me Darth Vitiate is not as well known, if you go hard when it comes to Star Wars, there is a chance that this is a Sith Lord you might recognize thanks to his extensive history and his impressive feats. Truly this is a Sith Lord that earns the unstoppable part of this title. Darth Vitiate is the son of the Sith Lord Dramoth. Even growing up he showed a great penchant for power and influence, conquering his own village and people by the age of 10 on planet Madrius. Hearing of this, Lord Dramoth came to to see for himself what chaos his son had wrought and was killed by his son. Unafraid and filled with brazen confidence, Tenebrae, as he was known at the time, would end up making his way to Dark Lord of the Sith, Marco Regnos, where he would prove himself and be rewarded with the title of Sith Lord, becoming known as Lord Vitiate. He would also go on not just to become a Sith Lord, but also take for himself the title of Emperor. Vitiate would set out with his forces to once more find and reclaim the Sith homeworld of Droman Kaz, ushering in the new dawn for his Sith Emperor. Empire. Seeking complete immortality, Vitiate also sought to gain more power and in essence basically become a god, becoming probably one of the most ambitious Sith Lords we have ever ever known in Sith history. Vitiate and his empire were first alluded to in the video game Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic number 2, The Sith Lords. Starting us off into number 10, Bootface. Okay, this guy's origin is the reason I wanted to talk about him. Bootface's origin was getting kicked in the face by Batman. That's it. I'm not even kidding. Bootface was a thug working for Terminus. He got his name because of the boot print embedded in his face, which like I said, is from Batman. Bootface first appeared in Batman and Robin volume 2 number 10 from 2012 and honestly it's one of the most interesting origins I've seen and I mean this completely seriously everyone else has like relatives die or was living in poverty this dude just got kicked in the face and got so mad that he became a supervillain like even if he wasn't really a good person beforehand I mean like he was a thug and basically still is but this time he has a ridiculous name and a man who is fueled by pure rage because he was permanently scarred by his attacker that ends up being a superhero yeah that's good enough for me plus I hadn't heard of this guy, so maybe you didn't either. 
and a 9 Professor Pig. Professor Pig originally debuted in the alternate reality story of Batman number 666, which I love. However, was introduced as a recurring character in 2009 in Batman and Robin number 1. In Batman Reborn, Laszlo Valentine was an extreme circus mob boss until something turned him into Professor Pig, leading him to begin funding his scientific experiments by selling, um, illicit substances to the criminal underworld. All in all, he's an extremely disturbing villain and makes me think about why people aren't afraid of pigs as they are afraid of clowns. Because if you ask me, this guy is freaking horrifying. Professor Pig, if you couldn't tell, actually ends up wearing a pig mask along with a butcher's apron and what at times appears to be some form of hastily thrown together surgical outfit. This is just freaking weird and he ends up brainwashing and controlling various people and he ends up calling them dollatrons. Straight up, I don't know what else to do with him other than just run away, so I'm going to move on now. Although next time I have a pet pig in Minecraft, I know what I'm naming him. And it ain't Joker's daughter. Unfortunately, it's not Joker's biological daughter. That would just, that would be a very interesting story. But this is just the girl who finds Joker's face, stitches it onto hers, and then goes berserk. So honestly, it could very well be his biological spawn. The only person that I think could commit such an atrocious act like this is the Joker, so who knows. While maybe not being as prolific and accomplished as the Joker, Joker's daughter is definitely insane enough to make this list. Even if I'm pretty sure many people know about her. But hey, even if one person didn't and they watched this video, then boom, it's enough for me and it counts. But not to mention the fact that she also went by Catgirl, Scarecrone, Riddler's Daughter, Penguin's Daughter, Card Queen, and Harl Quinn. Each incarnation also calling herself the respected super person's daughter. Which I have to say is going to make the family reunion very awkward. But in actuality she ended up being Duella Dent, Two-Face's daughter. Apparently. Which is, seems like BS. But we all love a girl with a little flair, you know? Number 7, Crazy Quilt. Crazy Quilt actually might sound familiar to you in terms of his overall personality and demeanor, as it seems like the version of Polka Dot Man that we saw in the Suicide Squad, to me at least, is actually closer to a combination of the original Polka Dot Man mixed with, well, this villain, Crazy Quilt. Crazy Quilt was Paul Decker, a painter and criminal who left clues in his artwork as to his criminal plots. Eventually, he was apprehended, left blinded by a gunshot wound in the scuffle. He would regain his sight through an experimental procedure where his optic nerves were attached to a helmet, but the blinding colors that he would see would cause him to go insane. At least when I was watching The Suicide Squad, I was like, this polka dot man kind of reminds me of polka dot man mixed with crazy quilts, because he's so crazy. Number 6, Unis the Untouchable. Another villain who almost foiled the X-Men in their early days was Unis. Unis the Untouchable was a mutant who couldn't be touched by those who would do harm to him, making him seemingly invincible when he first came up against the X-Men in issue 8. His power was also weirdly specific as it didn't repel all things from him and mainly seemed to target those who fought against him and projectiles that would do him harm. Beast was the one to help defeat him when he learned of his true nature in a wrestling match against him. This was during a brief moment when Hank McCoy left the team. When Unis turned to a life of crime, Beast was the one to stop him by creating a device that intensified his power, causing everything to be repelled from Unis, including food. Starving, Unis eventually agreed to stay on the straight and narrow, and Beast returned his power levels to how they once were, allowing Unis to return to his wrestling career. Number 5, Ruby Thursday. Ruby Thursday is a super weird villain who I still can't even really believe to this day actually exists. But she does. I believe she was kind of designed as a character on a dare, but don't quote me on that story as it's just something I remember reading somewhere. I didn't have time to go back and double check all that, but I'm pretty sure her creation story is something like someone dared someone to create a thing. It's a good story if you want to go check it out. Her creation is credited to Steve Gerber and Sal Buscema. And she first appeared in Defenders issue 32 in the 70s. Her whole thing is that she is a sexy villain lady, but in the place of where her head should be, she instead has a big red ball that is made up of organic circuitry and thereby gives her powers while also acting as a stand-in head because you still need the head to do things so yeah <laughs> Number 4, Spook. A villain I love to talk about, but whom no one really seems to remember apparently. Val Caliban was a master escape artist who first appeared in Detective Comics back in the 70s. He was initially caught and long thought to be dead after being executed, or at least we thought he was executed, appearing in an almost ghost inspired robe of a costume. In reality, Caliban had survived using his skills of hypnosis and escapism. He was also privy to the architectural plans of the prison as he'd worked to help design it. Thereby, he was able to exploit that knowledge and use it to escape. Honestly, it was it was pretty silly of them to try to put him in a prison that he'd designed, in my opinion. Years later though, he wouldn't be so lucky when changes had been made to its design and he ended up back in the prison again. And he'd be even more unlucky when he ran into Damian Wayne. Damian Wayne. 
Number three, Gaggy. Gaggy was the sidekick of Joker. Before there was Harley Quinn, there was Gaggy. Although to be clear, Joker and Gaggy were not in a romantic relationship. Just thought I'd point that out. They were simply partners in crime. In fact, when Harley did start coming around, it was later revealed that Gaggy actually became jealous of her, and even that she was perhaps the reason for Gaggy's fall from glory in the Joker's eyes. At least that was how Gaggy saw it. He basically blamed Harley for all of it. More recently, Gaggy made a reappearance in the Batman 3 Joker's limited series, but Sadly, he was killed off in that book, being eaten by a Joker shark. R.I.P. Gaggy. I love how Gaggy came back and then they were like, he's dead. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Bye. Number two, Tattered Damalion. Tattered Damalion is by all accounts a pretty weird and obscure villain who at one point was stopped by Dazzler. He doesn't really have any powers, but instead has some kind of forgotten skills, possibly. He started out initially as a tap dancer who found fame in the movies with his dancing partner, Julia Walker. Knowing eventually his star would dim, he invested money in a casino in Las Vegas, but later, after he retired to run it, was swindled out of his investment and money by criminals. Following that, he became a derelict and ended up allied with the committee. He eventually would become the crazed criminal Tattered Damalion, who sought to destroy money and material possessions as a means of revenge for what had unfairly happened to him. Honestly, it seems pretty fair of him to go that route. Eventually, Daz stopped him and helped to reunite him with his former dance partner, Julia Walker. But eventually, she would grow tired of looking after him. <laughs> Which also, fair. Number 1. Snowflame Snowflame was originally a villain that first appeared in the 80s in DC Comics, making his first appearance in New Guardians issue number 2, and coincidentally, his last appearance as well. In the New Earth continuity, anyways. Snowflame's powers are fueled by drugs, which grant him superhuman speed, strength, pyrokinesis, and made him numb to pain. He could also infect other people, intoxicating them merely by touching them. And guess what? There's more. It gets better. In 2020, he actually made a return in the Prime Earth continuity appearing in the 2018 Catwoman series in issue number 23. So while he still remains obscure, he's also kind of recently renew as well. Yay. Number 10, Killer Moth. Killer Moth, unlike a lot of the characters on this list, isn't really that powerful, but that's not what makes them underrated and in need of more attention. Killer Moth is just Fun. Drury Walker first appeared all the way back in Batman number 63 from February of 1951, and his whole shtick is just goofy. While other characters have taken their inspiration from having similar backstories to the Batman, the Killer Moth wanted to be the criminal's version of Batman, so he got himself a moth signal and a moth mobile and the name of Killer Moth. Ah! So scary! Not really. He even set up a false identity as millionaire philanthropist Cameron Van Clear. In that form, he became friends with Bruce Wayne, which is actually interesting. I doubt he even knew about Bruce's hobby of bat cosplay, but meanwhile, he promoted himself to Gotham's criminals using his identity as Killer Moth, giving them each an infrared moth signal to call him to their aid. Now, he didn't really fight for them. Instead, he kind of just became the distraction for the authorities so the real criminals could get away. You see why he really didn't become so popular? It's just kind of hilarious, and although his character has evolved a bit by then, no one has taken him that seriously, so just like Kite Man, he needs his time to shine. Number 9. Calendar Man Julian Gregory Day, whose name is a pun on the Julian and Gregorian calendars, has an obsession with dates. Committing crimes that always have a relationship to the date that they are being committed on usually covering the major holidays. Like most of the messed up members of the Batman's rogues gallery, Calendar Man has a rough childhood. His parents neglected him, which almost resulted in his passing away from days of exposure, which in turn resulted in his complete psychotic obsession of days and holidays. I don't know how those two mix, that's just how it goes. First appearing in Detective Comics number 259 in September 1958, Calendar Man was a bit sillier, using different costumes to commit crimes based on the days of the calendar, like dressing as an Indian magician representing the monsoon season. But after the crisis on Infinite Earths, Calendar Man was barely used and got a great revamp by writer Jeff Loeb in Batman The Long Halloween. In this new version, Calendar Man was institutionalized in Arkham Asylum and was deemed as an insane, ruthless criminal with abbreviations of the months tattooed around his head in a circle with no silly costumes or ridiculous crimes. Just his name. Number 8. Wrath. 
a young, successful, and secretly entirely evil CEO, Wrath is capable of being both Batman and Bruce Wayne's number one nemesis and antithesis, and yet almost no one cares or knows about him. Wrath first appeared back in 1984 as basically an anti-Batman. And while that may sound like a lazy writing exercise and may make you think he won't be popular, he did it before the major villain Prometheus ever even conceived of the idea. Wrath's parents were two burglars who were accidentally taken from this plane of existence by a young police officer who stumbled upon them and thought they were robbing their own house. As you can imagine, this is quite the villain backstory to turn a young Wrath completely against the law. He then dedicated his whole existence to going against them. Wrath even ended up training a young ward of his own named Elliot Caldwell, who you might have guessed became his version of Robin. Caldwell eventually takes on the role of Wrath himself, filling in his mentor's shoes, and he remained as the villain after the New 52 reboot. And yet, Wrath is nowhere to be seen, and you basically probably never heard of him. And you probably never will. Number 7. Villainy Incorporated Villainy Incorporated was a group of women who were former villains of Wonder Woman's trapped together on Transformation Island. Seriously, it's what it's called. Transformation Island is basically like Themyscira's version of, I guess, like a prison, but I think it's more supposed to be for like reforming criminals, hence Transformation Island. They ended up teaming up in order to escape their dismal fate in issue number 28 of the 1942 Wonder Woman series. Together they manage to capture and overpower Wonder Woman, but as they try to escape, Wonder Woman manages to break her bonds and recapture these rebellious prisoners. While you may recognize some of the villains on the Villainy Inc. team, not all are easily recognizable. You might know Cheetah, Dr. Poison, or even Giganta, but how about Blue Snowman, Hypnotic Woman, Queen Clea, Zara, or one of my favorites, Evil S. Villainy Inc., while initially quite unknown, was recently revived in another incarnation brought together by Hera in 2022's Wonder Woman issue number 784. Legacy numbering, of course. Number 6. Armageddon Armageddon is actually a legacy villain, but despite the fact that there have been multiple Armageddons, it's still likely not a name that most would be super familiar with. I mean, you know the word Armageddon, but I don't know if you really know the character. The original Armageddon fought alongside Germany during World War II on the side of the Axis. He was first introduced in the 1970s in issue number 234 of the original Wonder Woman comic. His son and his granddaughter thereafter would also end up taking up the villainous mantle of Armageddon, explaining his strength and theirs originating from being descended from the mythical beasts known as ogres. I mean, that'll make you strong. Ogres are definitely super strong. Number 5. Darano. Donna Troy always seems to have an interesting and kind of ever-changing origin story in the comics, as each DC reboot seems to revamp the origins of where the original Wonder Girl came from. During the Wonder Woman series that started in 2011, the story once again got a refresh of sorts when Darano was introduced. Darano was once the lover of Hippolyta, who after being turned into an old crone and drained of all her youth and her beauty, decided instead to live out her days mostly in seclusion. When she learned that Hippolyta had a child with Zeus, the baby that would one day grow up to become Wonder Woman, she set out to make a better heir for the people of Themyscira, spiteful of her former lover and queen. Thus, Donna Troy was created. Darano helped Donna to vie for the throne, and the two almost succeeded in usurping Wonder Woman's position as inheritor. Number 4. The Children of Ares Ares has, honestly, a lot of children, and most of them have beef with Diana, to be honest, but this group of them are specifically known as the Children of Ares. Not just a descriptor of their familial connections, but instead a name for their group as villains. They are a team of children and villains created by Gail Simone and Bernard Chang, who first appeared appeared in the 2006 run of Wonder Woman in issue number 39. They were only around for a few issues, but were sired by Ares and birthed by magically impregnated Amazonian women. These children challenged Diana using their mind control abilities and manipulation skills to basically discredit her, tarnishing her reputation as the hero known as Wonder Woman. Number 3. Troya Donna Troy is well known for being a member of the Teen Titans, a superhero, and basically Wonder Woman's kid sister. Or at least, she used to be Wonder Woman's kid sister. She's kind of like an adult herself now. While she has made tons of appearances, the reason I included her here was actually because I wanted to talk about a lesser known aspect of the character. That she has, in the past, or rather in a future, been Wonder Woman's greatest enemy. How did this come to pass? Well, this version of Donna Troy is actually from an alternate future. Far in the future, this version of Donna is a villain who goes by the name of Troya, and has done 
done so for over a millennia. Troya actually isn't an uncommon name for Donna to use. She's used it before in other versions of the character, but this one, whoo, it uses it in a pretty deadly way. In her reality, many of her fellow Titans perished, and Donna came to the realization that she was basically made solely to be a weapon, embracing this as her destiny. She killed many villains and heroes alike, including Diana herself. For her part in the lie of what Troya believes she once was as Donna Troy. Cause you know, Wonder Woman was like, love and all of that good stuff. And Troy basically ended up realizing like, nah, that's all BS. Number two, Earl of Greed. While Mars, also known as Ares, is very well known in the comics, some of his agents have fallen by the wayside since his days and their introduction and the old days of comics. Originally, Ares was known by the alternative name of Mars, the Roman name for the god of war. And after he was first introduced to us in Wonder Woman issue number one, we'd also come to be introduced to his cohorts and agents, the Duke of Deception, the Count of Conquest, and of course, the Earl of Greed. The Earl of Greed took on other names throughout his appearances in history, I believe, including that of the leader of the Third Reich and Dr. Prexy Deacon. The Earth II original version of the Earl of Greed made less than a handful of appearances in the comics, first appearing in issue number two of Wonder Woman back in 1942. Hence why you probably haven't seen him for a while. Maybe these guys will come back one day though. Maybe they have and I missed it or something, but yeah, they're pretty, they're pretty classic. Number one, the Sovereign. The Sovereign is a villain who has only just made his first appearance in Wonder Woman, since this will be a new villain for Tom King's run on Wonder Woman, which was released on the 19th of September of this year, 2023. We don't really know too much about him just yet. Initially, it was believed the Sovereign would be the name of a group opposing Wonder Woman, turning her into a wanted criminal and outlaw in America after the Amazonians' invitation to stay in the nation was basically rescinded. In issue number one of Wonder Woman, we learn that while the Sovereign reigns said group, it is actually not the name of the collective group, but instead a title held by its ruler, the Sovereign, who also comes armed with the Lasso of Lies, which I gotta say I love, which he can use to bend the American people to his will. We also learned that the Sovereign is a title passed down through generations of a family in America, which began with a Lord who first traveled to its shores long ago, seeking adventure and fortune. Number 10, Boomerang. Fred Myers was born in Australia, but moved to America when he was but a small child. In America, due to his great love of baseball, he developed an extraordinary pitching arm. He became a professional baseball player in the minor leagues after graduating high school, and a few years later, entered the major leagues. Within a year, he was suspended though for accepting bribes. With an arm like that and no job, he was eventually contracted by the subversive criminal organization, the Secret Empire, and offered employment. For him, they designed special weaponry for him to exploit his pitching ability, and he became their special operative, codenamed Boomerang. Why Boomerang? No idea, cause he's Australian probably. Now Boomerang's first fight was actually with the Incredible Hulk, which makes no sense at all. Eventually he would recalibrate his aspirations and take on more reasonable heroes like Spider-Man, which he did multiple times, but notably as part of the Sinister Syndicate, and he even had his own Sinister Six team. Number nine, White Rabbit. For someone so incredibly inept at committing crimes, White Rabbit sure does have a relatively long history in Marvel Comics. In the beginning, sheltered rich girl Girl, Lorena Dodson committed her first crime by ending the life of her 87 year old arranged husband as she found the trophy wife life boring. She then used her inheritance to buy a bunch of high tech equipment and being inspired by Alice in Wonderland, she went off as the villainous White Rabbit. For her first crime, she shall rob a fast food joint. This dastardly crime brought her into confrontation with the most fearsome of heroes, Frogman, and she almost brought him down too if it wasn't for the intervention of Spider-Man, who finished her off with an astounding amount of ease. Spider-Man has actually defeated her on multiple different occasions with the same amount of ease, and she's even been defeated by Mary Jane Watson. Don't even get me started on the amount of animal-themed villains she has allied with. In fact, she's allied with a lot of other low-level villains as well, but never to any amount of great success. She does have a giant, heavily armed robotic rabbit though, and that part, that part is kind of cool. Number eight, the Menagerie. The Menagerie is a slightly more recent evil team showing up for the first time in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3, number one in April of 2014. This was when they tried stealing a valuable decorated egg from an antique store and 
pretty easily defeated. So like from the get go, the impressive feats are on the lower side with this team. In fact, I'd say the most famous thing they've ever done is when they disintegrated Spider-Man's spider suit, making him have to create web underwear for himself. And it's the underwear that is remembered here, not the team. The animal themed criminal team was created by White Rabbit, who we just talked about, and its members included Hippo, Ox, Gine, who did the Spider-Man suit disintegrating, a squid, Swarm, and wait for it, Pandamania. Very cool. The Menagerie also is known for trying to rob a club where Nadia Van Dyne was celebrating her birthday with numerous other heroes, which as you can imagine, did not work out well for them. Number seven, Colonel Sulphur. This Denny O'Neill created villain from the 70s is an espionage expert with weaponized artificial hands, a tool he has used to commit very espionage type crimes. He's very Bond villainy if we're being honest. Colonel Sulphur has a strange sunlight fixation, meaning he only allows himself to act on his violent urges in the quote, morning's earliest minutes, which is one hell of a specific yet very obscure time frame for criminal activity. He did actually prove to be a bit more of a threat though when he joined the Army of Crime. When the Army of Crime's activities were challenged by Batman and Superman, Sulphur used an alien weapon to trap Superman and Batman in a timeless dimension. Sulphur used stolen tools of the trade to take over Gotham City, but as you may suspect, he was soon stopped by Batman and Superman who had escaped from the timeless dimension. These things happen man, they're superheroes, sorry dude. Number six, Condiment King. When the villainous Condiment King came on the scene, it was literally on the scene, as he appeared in the animated Batman TV show from 1992, one of the best, honestly. Condiment King was Buddy Stantler, a comedian who was brainwashed by the Joker into becoming a villain. He wields condiment squirters and viciously horrible puns. Stuff like, I knew you'd catch up to me sooner or later, or how I've relished this meeting. Come Batman, let's see if you can cut the mustard. You get the idea, that was stuff like that. The puns get even worse worse in the comics with his real name becoming a pun on its own, Mitchell Mayo. I am not joking. He is not taken seriously by anyone, including all of us. His weapons don't actually project his condiments at a speed fast enough to do anyone harm, but they sure are inconvenient, leaving nasty stains in your superhero costumes. On the other hand, he does potentially have the ability to be able to cause anaphylactic shock if he's battling someone with an allergy. Number five, Flamingo. Eduardo Flamingo, known as Flamingo is a world famous serial taker of life and an assassin. He is well known for a specific thing he does which inspired his sometimes name of the eater of faces, which really just explains itself. Eduardo was actually a morally strong advocate and fighter against organized crime, but that all changed when he was captured and underwent forced brain surgery that altered his personality, making him dangerously psychotic. Now the incredibly colorful flamingo is an enforcer and assassin, rocking a very unique look and somehow totally making a pink motorcycle not look silly. He has a dark, unfeeling personality and is an expert marksman which makes up for his lack of powers and makes him a pretty dangerous threat for Batman. He has even temporarily paralyzed Damian Wayne, so think twice before you judge cause he'll chew your face off, literally. Number four, Lord Deathman. The Japanese crime boss known as Lord Deathman has battled Batman both in American comics and in Japanese manga using his powers to seemingly overcome death itself, able to rise from the grave no matter what his injury is. In his first appearance in Batman 180 in May of 1966, he passed away a total of three times using a yogi technique to appear passed away before the final conflict which saw him get struck by lightning and actually pass away. But since then he has actually gained the real real power to come back from the dead, but at the cost of having a bare bone skull for a head. I don't know why. His regenerative abilities are so powerful that his sweet red red is used to create the infamous Lazarus pits that Ra's al Ghul uses to stay young and immortal. One of the first ways Batman defeated Lord Deathman with his new powers is honestly a little out of character for the Crusader. He threw Lord Deathman off a building into the path of an armored car which took the criminal down just long enough for Catwoman to lock him in a safe and then he was shot out into space. And he still, still somehow came back. Number three, 
Pig. Professor Pig is a villain that came to be during a time when Batman stories were becoming incredibly dark. And Pig himself has to be one of the darkest villains of that time. His methods completely disgust the Dark Knight and also most of us. He looks like a character straight out of a horror or a slasher movie and his obsession with physical perfection, like the myth of Pygmalion, which is where his name comes from, became part of the reason that he turned his victims into his own mind controlled servants called Dolotrons. If his crimes were horrifying enough, then I mean just, just look at him, yikes! No! Number two, Humpty Dumpty. With his house being demolished, his dog being run over, and his parents being crushed by a Christmas tree on Christmas, things were not looking too great for Humphrey Dumpler. He was mistreated by his grandmother, who he was forced to live with, and because of his appearance and mental capacity, he was also bullied. Of all things, the last straw for Humphrey was missing a subway train. Humphrey was obsessed with fixing things, and since the missing of the subway train, he started going out late at night to disassemble and reassemble mechanical devices which had upset him in some way or another. But since he wasn't very intelligent and all the info he got was from books, the things he fixed and reassembled actually caused a lot of accidents. The first thing was the same train that he missed which then crashed due to his manipulation. Now going by Humpty Dumpty, he was tracked down by Batgirl who dislocated her shoulder trying to save him. Humpty fixed her shoulder but then he also revealed that he had evolved from disassembling devices to disassembling and reassembling people. Namely, his grandmother who he believed to have been broken and in need of repair. So he took her apart then attempted to sew her back together again with bootlace. That got dark. And in at number one today, it's Cornelius Sturk. Cornelius Sturk is one of those villains that you don't hear about much, but is one of the more gruesome and terrifying members of Batman's rogues gallery. Sturk suffers from delusions which make him believe that he requires the nutrients of a human heart in order to stay alive, and not just any heart. Specifically, Cornelius believes that the heart is the most nutritious when it is full of norepinephrine, a natural hormone that secretes when a person is terrified, as well as adrenaline. So he uses his unexpected explain psionic ability to mentally make people perceive him as someone else, which other than allowing him to break out of Arkham Asylum the first time, also allowed him to get close to his victims and then completely terrify them in the most insane ways before he quickly ends them and partakes in a nice old hearty meal. Pun intended. I think the interesting thing about Sturk though is that he is actually really effective at what he does, being able to evade Batman and even render him unconscious on one occasion. 